Well, I am Sally Barrett, and I have been going to this church on and off when I am not in Europe uh, for many years, actually in high school. You may or may not remember, but I was in two performances here. The first was Godspell, and the second was I played um, in A Time for Christmas, but it was the remake when they added the 80s scene, because I got to be in that one. So they always had, I was always the one in the weird costumes. Um, but I am from Yorktown. I graduated from Ball State University with a major in hospitality and food management and a minor in leadership studies, both which I'm not using right now, but that's okay. It was in, during my time when I was at Ball State that I got involved with CREW, which is a Christian student organization. It's actually the largest student-led organization on Cruz University, and it's a Christian organization, so that's really, that's really cool. Um, and so it was during that time that I'd really started to grow more in my walk with the Lord and even understanding the importance of sharing that with others, and that ended up leading me to what I am doing now, which is I am working in Ljubljana, Slovenia with Crew as international campus staff for the past four years. And so you might ask, where is Slovenia? Well, that's a great question. I have a picture of it right here. Um, it's actually on the next slide. There we go. So Slovenia is part of former Yugoslavia, um, which many people know of Yugoslavia, but they can't always remember where it's located because countries change all the time. Um, and so I put this here to help. But Slovenia is at the top. It is surrounded by Italy, Austria, Hungary, and Croatia. So it's the size of Rhode Island. It's super small. From where I live, you can be out of the country in any direction within about an hour, hour and a half. So that gives you an idea of the country that I currently live in. Um, but what I'm doing is I'm working with college students um, in Slovenia. And, oh, I forgot to mention the population's two million, very small. But on the next slide, um, it even just shows, it's culturally Roman Catholic. 97% of people would say they're Roman Catholic, but that's very cultural. Um, when you ask them what that means, they'll say, oh yeah, I'm a Christian, but I don't believe in God. For us, we would say that's contradictory. Um, for them, it makes sense, because it's in their culture. And so, a realistically less than 1% are actually Bible-believing Christians. Many may have heard of the name of Jesus, but the more majority of them have no idea what he has done. And so, when we're working with these students, we are working right now on three campuses. The main one is 64,000 students. So we're on all of the campuses in Slovenia. So basically, we're attempting to talk to every single college student in Slovenia, which is a very large task, but um, the Lord's definitely at work. And so I'll share a couple stories today, but I feel like a common thing um, is people having these questions about missions. And they want to know, what do I do when I'm doing missions work, and what exactly is missions? And so today, I'm going to even be talking about what is missions, and how does it apply to us when we're not doing missions as vocational ministry? Because um, it's easy for me to think about missions when it's on my mind almost 24-7, but what does it look like when maybe that's not our actual quote-unquote job? And so, um, yeah, today I'm going to look at a couple verses to get a better idea of what God's thoughts are on missions. And as a Christian, I think it's one of the most important things for us to understand. Um, after the resurrection and before Jesus was taken up to heaven, he made many, many references of what believers were supposed to do once he left. And they pertain to missions. And so therefore, it's very important for us to understand. And so, one of them we'll be looking at soon, but first I'd like to just pray for us. Um, dear Lord, I thank you for this time for us to come together. I thank you for just growing in us a heart and a desire to learn from your word and 
to be able to have your very word available to us. And so I pray you would just give us a deeper understanding of what it looks like to share that with others um, and what you have communicated to us. Amen. So I'd like for us to look at what is very common for many of us, Matthew 28, when he's talking about the Great Commission. So I have on it Matthew 28, 18 through 20, but I'm going to actually read starting from 16. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So, I'm sure many of you know that, if not all of you. Um, as a missionary, we know that one very well. <laughs> um, in fact, it's a one verse that we talk with our students a lot, giving, helping them understand it. And so, what I like about this, well, I like many things about this, but this is a passage, well, is the passage that Matthew records Jesus' last saying. So, not his actual last words, but this is the passage that Matthew last records. And so, it comes at a very climactic time. We've just had Jesus was on the cross. Um, he rose back to life. And then, as we know, after this is Pentecost, and where he goes back up to heaven, and um, the Holy Spirit is given to people. So this is right in between these large events, and this in itself is also a large event that he's sharing with people. And so one thing that I think is really interested, first few times I read this was this word doubted. Um, which is emphasized a little bit on the next slide. And so, as I was reading this more and more, which there's a commentary, Bible commentary I use all the time, uh, called Constance. It's I absolutely love it because I am not the most intelligent when it comes to all the history and everything and does a great job. But it was talking about how this word, oh, I'm sorry if I mispronounce it, is edistasen, edistasen which also means hesitated. And so, this is interesting. Jesus' own disciples hesitated. They had questions. Um, the same people who saw him die and then saw him alive after his death hesitated. I find that so interesting. And so, I think for many this could make us feel relieved because we think, okay, if Jesus' own disciples hesitated, I'm okay. It's okay that I can hesitate now and then, and I feel a little better. I don't feel as bad. They're human. I'm human. That gives us a sense of relief. Um, for some, it may make us feel nervous. And we might think, why should that make us feel nervous? I like to call it excuses. Many times we think, okay... Oh, I'm too nervous to talk to this person. I don't necessarily feel prepared. Maybe I should wait till like I'm ready, till I no longer feel anxious or nervous. If we do that, though, we may never talk to anyone about Jesus. I know that because I have been there, and I think it was the first time I felt and understand, understood that, okay, I don't necessarily always have to feel super prepared Jesus' own disciples felt nervous. It's okay if I do too. And so, trust me, I have totally felt that as well. But I stepped out anyways and I shared the gospel with people. And if Jesus can use his own disciples, he can use us. And he can use us even when we don't feel the most prepared. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So, because of Jesus' death and resurrection, God mediates all authority through Jesus. So he is now, Jesus is, has universal authority. He's sovereign control over everything, everything, which we all know. And previously, his work was in Israel. If people, people wanted to 
personally know him. They wanted to spend personal time with him. They had to be where he was at. And now, now people can know him everywhere. He's sending them out to the world. As we know now, his disciples didn't know this at the time, but this was made possible through the Holy Spirit. And so at once, people always had to be with Jesus, know him personally. And now, through the Holy Spirit, everyone all over the world is made possible to know him personally because he's sovereign. He is now everywhere. And I think that's just one of the coolest things to, that I grew to understand. of The importance of this verse is that he's telling them, no, I'm sending you out and I'm making it possible for you to share this with everyone everywhere and that it will have effect on them personally. And he's asking them, he says, make disciples. And I think many times, at least in ministry, we think, okay, making disciples is this formula. I have to go through this sheet with them. Then we have these Bible studies. And he's simply just asking them to bring people into relationship with them. And he's saying to do this among all nations, so all tribes, all people, Gentiles, Jews, everyone. So then it comes up to, so therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Baptizing them into the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So this would simply suggest coming into relationship with Jesus and really pledging submission to his lordship. And so before, when John the Baptist, he's baptizing people, he's doing, this, he's doing this for the Israelites and preparing people for who the person of Jesus is, for what his work's going to be, which is awesome. He's getting them ready. But the exciting part is now, as Jesus is saying this, his work's already done. It's already been made complete. And so he's already taken that penalty of sin for people and so now there's something even better, and he's creating this opportunity for him, them to know him. And so this baptism is exciting because it's based on the finished work, the finished work of what Jesus has done. And so is more t- of an understanding of the finished work and agreeing with what it means, its significance. And so some of these slides, I've gone through a few of them already, just highlighting the words. Uh, But the next one, talking about the Trinity and really linking himself to God and the Holy Spirit. He doesn't say, you know, in the name of me, the Father, the Holy Spirit. He says, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, which I think is really interesting that he puts himself in the middle. He, he puts it as a link between God and the Holy Spirit. And at this point, they have not received the Holy Spirit. That hasn't come yet. They probably don't fully even know, as he's saying this entire verse, what it means. He knows it's significant because Jesus is saying it, and everything he says is kind of confusing, um, but it's significant. Uh, But they haven't received this yet. And so in his own words, though, he is reminding them of his divinity. He's showing them that he is God, that God is one, but God is three. Um, Which I think is just always cool through scripture when you can see the Trinity just being revealed throughout it. And then the word teaching. I have commanded you. So... He's not undermining the Old Testament, which is what they would have looked at at this point. Throughout his entire ministry, he validates the Old Testament. He validates its truth, its meaning um, throughout his entire ministry. But he's showing them that he is now the source of revelation, when beforehand it would have been Old Testament prophets. He is the source of truth. He is the source of authority. And because he is the source of authority, he is calling them to obey what he has commanded them. And so he's saying, you are the ones I'm asking to continue my ministry and teaching. Ends with a promise. So before this, most of the time, he's commanding them different things. Do this, do this. And then he ends with a promise. I am with you always. Which I just love because it just reminds me of his name, Emmanuel, 
that is prophesied throughout the Old Testament. I am with you always. God with us, Emmanuel. And that's just for forever. And Jesus uses the promise of his own power and presence to commission his disciples to then spread the gospel. So what are things that we can personally learn from this? Go, take action. I think one of the biggest things is people always want the ideal thing to happen. That's where people come to us and they say, teach me something about God. I want to know about Jesus. That would be wonderful. But that normally doesn't happen. We have to go. We have to take action and go talk to people. Another one is making disciples, sharing with people who Jesus is and what he's done. And I think the most common thing that I hear from people um, is they want people to know they're a Christian based on their actions, which I agree with. I think that's wonderful. That's a great way for people to know we're changed by the love of Christ. However, I'd also argue that many times it's not evident that we are Christian compared to someone else who maybe is also just as kind as us, just simply based on our actions. Um, And so therefore, I would say, I think the important thing is to share with people who Jesus is. Because even if they did know we were different than other people, that still might not give them enough understanding to know, how can I too know Christ like they do? We need to share with them. We actually need to speak these things with them. And then teaching them, helping them grow in their faith and understanding God's commandments. Who, who is Jesus? What has he called us to do? But through that knowing that we're able to do this only because of the authority of Jesus. But he's with us always and there's no fear. So one thing, I mean, one uh, verse I really like, which I also have up here. It's a few slides down, though. If it, it's, if it comes to it, is Acts 1.8, which I can go ahead and read. I don't know if it'll come up or not, but, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of of the earth. So, reason I like this is it just helps to remind me why we're capable of being witnesses. Um, because of the power of the Holy Spirit, we are his witnesses. And witnesses, you know, when I think of someone who goes to court and they're a witness and they're called to share what they've seen, they just say, they tell someone about what they've told Well, someone tells about what they've seen, what they've experienced. It's all about their their personal experience. And we're told to go to the ends of the earth to share with people what we have seen and experienced about Jesus. And I think an excellent example is a girl I met this year. Her name was Valeria. And I met her. She was studying English. And I met her in her building on college and got to talk with her found out she was a Christian very very rare to actually meet a Christian in Slovenia and so right away I'm a little skeptical I had to admit I'm like is this possible I know it is God's been here before I was here so she's definitely a Christian but this is crazy Um, and so we met up and she had a desire to just learn more and to share her faith And so, as we were talking one day, she had mentioned, okay, I really think that before I can share my faith, I need to read the Bible three times. And then I'll know everything, and then I'll be able to share my faith. And so, we went back and we read this verse. And I asked her, okay, so did you know the entire Bible when you became a Christian? She said, well, no. I I didn't. I said, what convinced you that Jesus was the way? And she said, well, the fact that even though I was a sinner, he still chose to die for me. 
I was like, well, knowing that, what are your thoughts about this verse? And she read it a couple times, and she stopped, and she said, well, if that was enough for me, then I think what I know about Jesus right now is enough for others. And that was huge for her to see God's already given her enough now. She, she knows him, and he's given her enough to share that with others. And since then, she's been sharing with her friends about who Jesus is. And that doesn't mean to not learn any more about the Bible. Of course, she's growing and she's learning more. But seeing that he's prepared her to begin sharing with, either, with others simply because she's a witness for him. And so with that, I would just really challenge you. I'm sure many of you already do this. Um, but just be reminded that you are capable, that God has prepared you. He's, he has already provided ways for you to be a witness with others. And so I have even a couple of questions. Are the slides working? Nope. Okay. Well, here's a couple of questions you could think about to even think of, think of okay, I'm a witness. How do I go about doing that? These are questions we often ask our students are, what are the greatest needs in your community? And thinking of these in relationship, you know, to God and, and how he's at work. What is your vision for your community? What do you want to see changed in your community? And then thinking about these questions, what is God calling you to do in your community? Oh, yay! It's working! So, so just feel free to spend time thinking about those questions. And if you're ever interested, one thing I do with students is I even help to, to help them through these questions as they're thinking of it, thinking of ways that they really feel called to share their faith and even helping to coaching them in that and through that. And so even if you're ever interested, I'm here for another six weeks. I would love to talk more about this with you. Not that I'm an expert in it, but I do enjoy it. So, the last story I'd like to share is Tiasha. I met Tiasha five years ago, my first time in Slovenia. And she was what I call a little infant in her faith. Um, she believed and she had a desire to grow, but she really didn't know much. And since then, Tiasha has just been so transformed by, by God. In fact, this year she broke up with her boyfriend of six years. That is very hard in Slovenia to get believers to break up with their non-believing boyfriends. And that was just a huge step in her growth with the Lord. And so I would like for, oh, this is actually a picture of her sharing her testimony. And now if you click on Tiasha's testimony, that's going to take us to a video of her sharing her testimony with you. So, hopefully it works. Is it coming up? No. Maybe you won't hear Tiasha's testimony. You might have to click it and then pre press another button that comes up that says go to link. Does that come up? If not, I will just share her testimony with you. <laughs> okay. That's all right. Um, I can just share it with you. Tiasha, being the only Christian in her family, um, became a Christian and really started to grow in her faith. And one thing she started to really grow in was just this desire of seeing that no one in her family knew Jesus. And I remember one of the first times she, I met up with her, she said, I'm so scared to share my faith, but I don't want everyone I know and love to go to hell. And she said, right now I know that's where they're headed. And the most encouraging conversation I had with her was actually our last one. So two times before it, we were meeting up, and she said, okay, I really, really want to share with my mom. It's really hard. I just don't know a good opportunity. And so we're like, okay, let's pray together. And 
and pray that God creates an opportunity. And so two days later, she's outside just on her computer and her mom's in the garden. Her mom goes, what do you think happens to our bodies when we die? Tiasha was like, is this an actual question? <laughs> her mom said, yes, what do you think happens to our bodies when we die? And Tiasha said, well, I think what's more important is what happens to our soul. She said, well, what do you mean by that? And she said, well, I mean, we'll go one of two places, either to heaven or to hell. Her mom said, oh, I know I'm going to heaven. Tiasha asked, well, why are you so certain? She said, well, because I'm a good person. I'm pretty kind. And Tiasha said, well, Mom, I thought that was it too for a long time. But I now know that it's not. It's because of Jesus and him taking the penalty of my sins on the cross, cross that he makes a way for me to go to heaven. It's through this relationship with him. And her mom said, well, how did you know all this? Like, where did you learn this? And she said, well, I, I've been talking with Sally, and we read the Bible, and she's been helping me understand it. And through that, I've received Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And her mom said, oh, we need to have Sally come here and, and share with us more about Jesus. Tiasha said, well, you don't need Sally. I can share these things with you. And her mom said, okay, well, then share with us. And, and Tiasha's response was, well, what do you want to know? And her mom goes, what do you think I need to know? And so Tiasha spent the next hour sharing her testimony and the gospel with her mom and just sharing about how, although she had grown up going to church, she had never heard what Jesus did for her. And she always thought she just had to be a good person. And it wasn't until she found out about Jesus being a Lord and Savior that she gave her life to Christ. And so it's been through that that she's been able to have more and more conversations with her mom, with her siblings, with some of her best friends. And we actually challenged her to consider joining us and working with us this coming year. And so it's just really cool to see that the Lord's doing this in the lives of students in Slovenia. And those students are sharing it not just with their friends, not just with their classmates, but also with their family members. We have story after story of students sharing with their grandmothers, with their mothers, people who have had an impact on them that it can seem really intimidating. They're getting to lovingly share with others. And so this is just some of what I do when I'm in Slovenia. And things that I even consider you to, challenge, to be challenged of thinking of how you can do it also. Um, and so while I'm in Slovenia, well, I'm currently back here in the States because to be in Slovenia, I have to have funds to be in Slovenia. And similar to other nonprofit Christian organizations, crew does not have its own money. It's all through the support of concerned individuals who want to fund the ministry. And then that, those finances go to help fund specific ministries within crew. And so I think you can go to the next slide. But I am currently in the process, I had a lot of support drop off this year, of just raising about 550 in monthly support. That can be in any amount, but that would be about three people at 100 monthly and five people at 50 monthly. And so if that's something that you're interested in at all, or you even know of people who you think, okay, I think they would be interested in hearing about your ministry in ways that they too could be a financial partner, then feel free to just put your, I have this little sheet in your bulletin, feel free to just put your name and number and you can give it to me afterwards. And I'd love to just share more with you of what that would even look like. So. That is all I have with you today. Um, but yeah, if you have any more questions, please let me know. And if I'm not mistaken, I think now is just, I'll just double check so I'm not mistaken. Yes, it's now an in invitation to respond. And so if there's anything that you have on your heart, feel free to respond to the Lord in those ways.